Thanks everyone for joining us, uh, both here and online. Uh, I am Michael Davidson, I'm a professor here at the School of Global Policy and Strategy and at the Mechanical Aerospace Engineering Department at UC San Diego. Um, and we're gonna we're hosting this public lecture with the 21st Century China Center. Um, uh, today's lecture is going to be in hybrid mode. Uh, so we'll have some folks here and we'll have some folks on the on Zoom, and we will figure out how to incorporate questions from Zoom when we get to the discussion session later on in the, <laughs> in the session. I'm serious about this. Um, so uh, I am just really thrilled to have here today Jonas, who I was just thinking and when I, I first met him maybe a decade ago when we were both students at MIT, and I learned a lot from him at the time about field work in China that he had just started, and also a lot about industrial policy. And both of those became really interesting and important parts of, of my research uh, direction and is really um, very formative for me at the time. Um, so Jonas is Assistant Professor of Energy Resources and Environment at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, or SICE. Um, and he's a political scientist by training, but he does not your vanilla brand political scientist. While he does look at comparative politics, um, he has a lot of interest on climate policy, environmental politics, economic and industrial policy, and, I'm, and, his, and his book project today on collaborative advantage, uh, forging green industries in the new global economy, um, is going to tell us a lot about and give us a lot of insight into his very interdisciplinary background and research. Um, so I will look forward to that. Um, before we um, move forward, just sort of a couple of uh, house uh, rule, housekeeping rules here. So the lecture is being recorded um, and we'll have time for questions afterwards. So please use the Q&A box um, and um, we'll be curating questions and then giving them to Jonas after um, his presentation. Um, so with that, I will say, Jonas, take it away. We're looking forward to it. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you for um, inviting me. I feel like being based in DC, an invitation to California in February was always sort of an easy <laughs> decision. Um, and I did leave DC two days early because it was 10 degrees on Saturday morning and I decided I could bail and change my ticket and enjoy a weekend in San Diego. So I, that's what I did. Um, all right. So, um, Again, thanks for inviting me. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, you'll have to sort of make up in terms of energy for the people that are listening online. Um, I'll, I'm talking about um, a book that came out about a year ago, a little more than a year, um, that looks at how sort of similar industrial policies in the clean tech space uh, in China, but also in Germany and in the US led to very different kinds of industrial outcomes in these three places. And it's sort of an interesting time to talk about this book because it's, I've been lucky in the sense that the book has become sort of more relevant since it was published. We've had the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, the Europeans are pushing ahead with industrial policy and everyone's sort of responding in a way to China, um, not always in good ways, but I think certainly in interesting ways. And so there's been this global kind of resurgence of industrial policy uh, in many ways, I think sparked by Chinese efforts to really advance in these industries. Um, and so I'm going to use the book sort of to talk a little bit about the historical development of how we got to this place today, but I'm hoping that we can have a broader conversation afterwards about um, what these historical lessons sort of tell us about the possibilities of shifting uh, this division of labor that has emerged in these places um, over time. And so what I want to do, um, of course, now it's not working. Um, here we are. So what I want to do is sort of briefly talk about the outcome that I'm trying to explain in this project. So this di division of labor in these industries that's kind of pretty international. Um, I'll make an argument about why we got to this point. And then I want to run, and I know this is a China seminar, but I'm going to run through the German case and the Chinese case because those are so intertwined in many ways. Um, and then we can talk about China or the US or whichever other place you want. Um, uh, I was told I don't have a China quota to fulfill. I presented this somewhere else at a Chinese seminar and they said it had, the talk has to be 70% China. So um, this has been a little bit more laissez-faire here in terms of how we do this. But in that spirit, let me start with, you know, sort of the US and the Inflation Reduction Act, which really is not um, China. Um, so last summer we got this Inflation Reduction Act in the US, which may or may not inflation reduce inflation, probably doesn't. 
Um, but it's not really about that, right? At the core, there's a set of local content requirements in this and tax credits tied to these local content requirements, um, which are really the opening move in many ways uh, in redefining what the American economy might be about and what sort of the American relationship economically might be uh, with China. And so the US is sort of starting this process of catch up development of catching up with China as a result of this act, which is also a very unusual position for the US to be in. Um, and so it's an industrial policy bill in the, at, at the heart. And so the book that I'm talking about isn't really about whether the US is going to be successful at this endeavor of catching up with China, um, but it is a book about why the US ended up in a kind of division of labor with China that has been deeply unsatisfying to US policymakers in many ways. And so I think it prompted um, a lot of this, this action that's happening uh, now. And so the answer for sort of why the US is in this predicament that it is today, that it's trying to shift out of with the Inflation Reduction Act in many ways starts uh, in China. And so when I started working on this project sort of around the time that we met at MIT, I really wanted to understand why China was so rapidly kind of dominating these new industries. Wind and solar hadn't been around for very long. They were very kind of expensive still and sort of immature sectors, but China was doing really well. Um, in building supply chains in these industries. And in the US, I think people were starting to notice Obama was president at the time and started sort of talking about the clean energy race that the US needed to win with China. Um, it wasn't doing very well at doing so at the time. There was this solar firm, Solyndra, that got a bunch of government loan money and then went bankrupt with it. And so um, it certainly didn't seem like the US was kind of doing very well in that race. And in other parts of the world, I think people were also concerned about sort of China's impact on the changing global economy. Um, in Germany, there were a lot of concerns about whether sort of Germany as a high wage manufacturing economy could sustain its livelihood um, and that sort of particular way of running the economy in a world where China was dominating these supply chains. And so then I spent you know, years traveling through these industrial parks um, and various parts of China visiting wind and solar factories. And I was surprised that this wasn't really about a race at all, that there were engineers from the US and that there were engineers from Germany kind of collaborating on a lot of these projects. And Chinese firms were indeed very competitive, um, focusing sort of on the types of innovation and R&D related to taking new technologies and scaling up to mass production very quickly. But they were often doing this on production equipment that was produced in Italy or Germany or in the US and often using materials that came out of US DOE funded um, you know, government research. And so there was much more collaboration than I expected in sort of an interesting ways. And in many ways, these Chinese industrial parks were sort of centers in a global division of labor in which these three countries had actually taken on very kind of traditional roles um, in this division of labor in these new industries. And this certainly weren't kind of beachheads of uh, some sort of race uh, and clean energy. And so in Germany, firms were focused on what I call customization in this project. So um, you know, very complex components, uh, prototyping, production equipment, a lot of which has to be kind of manually assembled and has very small production runs. In China, firms were focusing on precisely the kind of innovation related to take new technologies and bring them to mass production. And in the US, we had this sort of wealth of startups at the time that were coming up with new technologies, but had very few capabilities in production and actually relied on partners in these other parts of the world to take these technologies to market. And so firms were kind of doing this very different kind of um, sort of industrial activity in these three places, despite uh, fairly similar industrial policies. And so I think we focused a lot on the differences between these countries, but actually, if you really look at it, China, Germany, and the US, and many other places were sort of combining subsidies for research and development and subsidies for clean energy markets. And we're hoping that those two levers would somehow combine into domestic supply chains for these industries. But what they got instead were sort of very distinct parts of these global supply chains. And I think that was surprising, you know, because, uh, because we were expecting, I think, you know, much more similar results given the sort of policy landscape. Um, but I don't think it was surprising that countries would trying to attract these supply chains in the first place, even if they were unsuccessful in doing so sort of in this kind of holistic way. 
because in all of these places, sort of switching to clean sources of energy required vast public resources, tax, you know, subsidies funded by taxpayers, regulatory efforts. And so governments basically all over the world wanted to show that in return for these kinds of public investments, they were getting kind of real local economic results. And so they were converging on this kind of portfolio of industrial policy measures to try to attract local industries. Um, I think it was surprising also for a second reason to see this division of labor, because if you think about it, China joined the WTO in the early 2000s. This is sort of the end of kind of the expansion of globalization in many ways. And wind and solar were really the first post-globalization industries that sort of started almost from scratch in this new economy. So there was, you know, if you wanted to look for a break from existing economic practices, these would have been the industries to find it because they basically wholly developed under, under sort of this globalization regime. But what we got instead was collaboration in these, in these industries. And so for a number of these early kind of key technologies in these sectors, you really got them to market with a kind of a combination of American, European, and, and Chinese firms. And most of that collaboration took place uh, in China for reasons that, that we can talk about a little later. And so why is this? I'm gonna get like a little bit political science here for a second, but I, um, I'm not gonna stay there for long, so bear with me. But basically the central question that I'm asking in this project is why we ended up with such distinct strength in these places. And that becomes important for conversations about decoupling because we're now trying to change this division of labor. And so how we got there is important for understanding where we're going. And the argument that I make in the book is that globalization itself really allowed us to get to these very distinct specializations. It's not really um, China's fault. It's also you know, not anyone's fault, really, in that sense. But it's about an economic system, kind of a change in the, how we run the global economy that enabled countries to do much more distinct and sort of specialized industrial activities than in the past. And so it's globalization itself that sort of enabled the system. And I think before we dive into that, I, I want to kind of talk briefly about what I mean by globalization. I think there are very different views on this and sort of perspectives, and I'm always kind of annoying at least three groups that are in the room. But if I may kind of stereotype a bit, I think economists would look at globalization as a pr process sort of of capturing efficiencies from outsourcing, right? So it's about kind of realizing comparative advantages and, and you know, offshoring things that you're not very good at at home. Um, and in some ways, I think that was the concern of the Obama administration at the time, right? Like, would firms outsource so many of their activities to China that sort of these traditional strength and innovation in the U.S. would no longer be feasible here? In kind of political science, there was a different concern about globalization. I think people really understood it as this kind of increasing economic pressure that would make us all the same, that you couldn't be France anymore in the global economy because you know, you could be competitive being France. And so there were these pressures for convergence and a huge literature kind of thinking about how much kind of economic distinctness can be preserved in that system. And when I talk to people on the shop floor in Chinese factories or German factories for that matter, they didn't really think about globalization in those terms. To them, globalization was this new world of collaboration where it was very easy for German family-owned businesses to send their engineers to Chinese partners and work in Chinese factories on solving a technical problem. And so globalization was about these connections and this ability uh, to collaborate. And I don't think these are mutually exclusive views, but I think the collaboration angle is kind of often missing in these other, um, other conversations. And so the book is called Collaborative Advantage for that reason. And I use it really as shorthand for the process in which uh, firms insert themselves and participate in that global system. And it's an advantage, or there's really two advantages at the core of this um, that are sort of the key argument of the book. And the first is that fir firms um, can participate in these new types of collaboration in the global economy. And because of that, um, they can specialize, right? If you can buy technical skills or production equipment or manufacturing innovation skills from other firms, you no longer have to develop it in-house. And so it's much easier for firms to actually specialize on sort of distinct strengths and then work with other firms uh, to get the other parts that you need to bring a new product to market, for instance. 
And so collaboration kind of obviates the need to develop all of the skills required to invent a technology and then commercialize it and bring it you know, to manufacturing. And so in many ways, that's sort of the kind of economic manifestation of, of this idea. And the second advantage is that because it enables specialization, um, globalization allows firms to pick very different pathways into these new industries. So since you don't have to know everything, you can figure out which part you do know. And for firms, that often means that they work with what they already know a little bit about, right? So you can reinvent your existing skills rather than reinventing the wheel as you enter these new sectors. And in doing so, you think about what kinds of support you get from your government, what kinds of institutions you can work with. And so what, you know, in this sort of political applic application of this idea, um, I make the argument that because of specializations, firms uh, could build on these existing strength of their domestic economy. So rather than going away because of this convergence, they get stronger. Uh, in that system because you can kind of capitalize on them in new ways. And so by allowing firms to kind of specialize and build on these domestic skills that already exist and repurpose these ex existing economic institutions, which I'll have a chance to talk about in a little bit more detail later, um, globalization enabled this division of labor to emerge across these different economies and, and borders. And so maybe I'll give an example, not from China, but from Germany. But um, one of the firms that I really loved visiting many times was this family-owned auto supplier um, that was trying to figure out a way to diversify away from the auto industry. And they figured out that um, by using sort of a, a laser that runs in a stream of water that is often used in kind of dental applications, they could perforate solar wafers in a way that they needed to be kind of etched at the surface without breaking them. And so developed this kind of solar production equipment um, as a result. But they did that together with a Chinese partner that was buying this equipment and was helping them kind of figure out the specifications of this. And so they became for a while kind of a big supplier of solar production equipment. Um, that industry kind of moved to China over time. And just before the pandemic, I visited them again in Germany to see what had happened to them. And I was kind of worried that they had kind of gone out of business. And they had built this gleaming new factory and had reinvented themselves again to now make parts of um, electric vehicle engines. And so, you know, they were sort of hopping from one industry to another, but often with a partner somewhere else in the world that allowed them to do that. And, and mostly with a partner in China where they also had a production um, plan. And so instead of undermining these sort of traditional economic institutions in these small towns in Germany that these companies were in, um, globalization and China's rise in that system really allowed these firms to reinvent uh, their skills, reinvest in these existing institutions and sort of strengthen them over time. They essentially became part of the sort of political coalition that kept these institutions alive. And so what I'm talking about in Germany are sort of kind of a traditional banking system with these small banks that don't have a lot of money to lend, but are very patient in their lending, a vocational training system that trains these very highly skilled manufacturing workers. Um, in the Chinese case, I'll get to it, we'll talk about uh, local kind of institutions that support manufacturing um, in you know, industrial development zones and sort of supported by local governments. And so it's quite the opposite of a race. It was because of this collaboration that these traditional specializations and strengths could be you know, maintained in this, in this highly globalized system. And, and um, it was because of this collaboration that we got wind and solar to be mature industries that um, had these very rapid cost declines, right? And so let me kind of make this more concrete by talking through these two cases, and then we can talk about decoupling as a way of now pulling the system apart again and what that might mean for our ability to meet climate goals um, and also for our ability to just sort of, uh, you know, get get products in other industries. I think there's sort of implications of this beyond, beyond these industries that I care about. And so I'll quickly talk about the German case because I think it's so interesting. Germany was this very high wage manufacturing economy. And you'd think that China would really have made their lives very difficult. And I think the Germans at the time were worried that their lives would be very, made very difficult. They had a big economic crisis at their, during the early 2000s, just sort of when China joined the WTO. Um, and there was a lot of pessimism about the ability to kind of sustain that level of kind of standard of living um, in, that, in that new world. 
And the story that I find in the German case is that these existing firms from other sectors like this auto supplier were able to enter wind and solar sectors um, through collaboration with Chinese partners and um, were able to then bring these existing local financial institutions, the vocational training system, all of these institutions into these new industries and sort of make them relevant for the next generation of industrial development. And in a way, China made that possible and China made these institutions in Germany relevant that we all thought were gonna go away in this kind of world of super competition and global supply chains. Um, Germany too had this very traditional kind of system of supporting industrial development in these sectors, you know, these sort of R&D programs for wind and solar technologies, other energy technologies, um, and then a series of kind of uh, market support mechanisms to help clean energy markets domestically. And the hope was that somehow that would yield wind turbine manufacturers and solar panel manufacturers. But what they got instead were actually producers of production equipment for the most part and component suppliers for the wind industry, actually not that many large firms um, that were making solar panels or wind turbines in that way. And so um, another example, um, I just love these German examples because they're so crazy in a way, if you think about it. So this is like a family owned business. They're always like in some like village in the black forest, like two hours from the next highway, you drive up these winding roads and then you get to this like high tech development zone in the middle of nowhere. They were founded in the 1800s as a foundry. They started making production equipment for furniture. You know, there were a lumber mill at some point. Um, it, in the 60s, when sort of uh, semiconductors became a thing, they started making screen printers. Um, then they entered the solar industry, working with uh, Shanghai Solar Manufacturer to develop production equipment for this new type of solar technology that was being pushed out at the time. And then they won a bunch of efficiency records with their solar equipment. So this is like a long journey through many different industries. Um, and the last couple of iterations were with kind of Chinese partners in that new global system. And so for these German firms, Chinese partners complemented uh, German manufacturers, which remained focused on much smaller production runs. So if you're focusing on like mass production equipment, like China was your, your friend. Um, Chinese demand provided incentives also to create uh, product sort of off the shelf components and production equipment for these technologies, because before that, these were small industries. You couldn't buy like solar production equipment. You would probably use like a semiconductor piece and then sort of retool it in your garage. Like that's how they sort of worked before then. And that really changed. And I think what many people don't realize, China was the first place to automate um, a lot of production in these industries because labor turnover was so high that it became really difficult to train workers. And so Chinese firms very early had an incentive to automate simple steps because they could just sort of avoid this training and recruitment problem that they had. Some firms had 20, 30% labor turnover a month. So every kind of three or four months, you basically have to retrain the entire workforce in these factories. Um, that's also the reason why I think these ideas of bringing manufacturing back are sort of a little um, delusional when we think about what that actually entails. I mean, very few people work there now. They're, they're highly automated, but that's not, um, you know, that's sort of a Chinese invention in that, in that sense. And so what Germany got as a result was a trade surplus in these industries for a long time with China as it sort of got rich selling production equipment and components to partners in these industries. And so you really see a very different discourse during that time in Germany about China, which is much less about threat and much more about opportunity maybe than, than in the United States. And I interviewed these firms and asked them sort of what institutions of the state were you reliant on as you moved into these new sectors? And it was precisely sort of this apprenticeship system that has long been at the core of the German manufacturing economy and these small credit unions that were willing to fund and finance sort of this reinvention of these local firms, but um, maybe couldn't have done that for much larger uh, sort of projects. And so if China was losing manufacturing at, or worried about losing manufacturing at the time, uh, China was worried about how to get out of manufacturing, right? So we had these opposite problems. China was already worried about kind of uh, how to move into innovation, get out of cheap manufacturing and sort of avoid the middle income trap, right? And so the central government in China was pushing innovation all the time and, and kind of R&D programs. Um, and so it was a very different kind of thinking, but, but in some ways worked out in parallel ways. And so what I found 
in China is that firms actually wanted to stay in manufacturing because that's what they knew how to do. Um, and they relied on local government kind of support to do that. Local governments also wanted them to stay in manufacturing because that yielded short-term economic results. Um, and so rather than moving beyond manufacturing and innovation, they started innovating in manufacturing itself and sort of you know, professionalizing that as a discipline. Um, and that's, you know, they didn't really want to get out of manufacturing because they didn't want to compete with other firms on their turf. Like they didn't want to compete with Germans on production equipment or with American startups on the invention of new technologies because they didn't really have the skills to do that. And so I think more so than in the US and the German case, the Chinese government and Beijing, the central government very much wanted competition and it wanted firms to compete head on on innovation. And so there are, of course, uh, a number of these kind of technology push programs that over time became more and more about kind of reducing technological independence uh, dependence on other countries and sort of building indigenous innovation skills. Um, there were also more and more generous um, subsidies for the creation of these markets um, domestically as well. And so what firms then did was focus on kind of innovate what I call innovative manufacturing, but essentially the kind of R&D required to change product design so it's more easy to manufacture, it's easy to scale. Um, R&D teams that in many ways look like R&D teams in any American company, but were focused on sort of a distinct set of challenges. If you already have the technological blueprint, how do you change that technology to reduce the cost um, and make it more easily manufacturable so you can compete in these, in these industries? And if you interviewed folks sort of about this period in, in these industries, they were kind of telling you, well, it was easy to license technology from other countries. Um, so that wasn't a problem. You could buy production equipment from other countries, but what you couldn't really figure out was how to manufacture these things at scale because no one had ever done it before. If you drive to from like, I don't know how you guys get to Palm Springs from San Diego, but if you drive from LA, you get you come sort of past that weird dinosaur museum, and then you kind of go down into the valley, and all these wind turbines are everywhere. There are lots of them kind of lying on the ground, burned out too. So you kind of get a sense for this fact that, like in the you know 1990s and early 2000s, these were very experimental industries. So no one had really figured out how to sort of mature it and professionalize it. And I think Chinese firms were seeing that as the challenge that they could contribute. Uh, to solving in, in this broader division of labor. And so what we got was a lot of collaboration under this indigenous innovation sort of term. Um, this 863 program doesn't exist anymore, but it was sort of the research program for applied technologies by the Chinese government. Firms could apply for subsidies or research funding through it for a set of designated technologies that changed every year. So solar panels would have to get more efficient, wind turbines larger. And Goldwind was one of sort of the big early wind companies. It was successful in getting funding in almost every funding round. The premise of this program was always that it would allow Goldwind to break up with its foreign partners, which they never did. So they took sort of federal or central government R&D funding and then repurposed it for their purposes and continued relying on these collaborations with other firms. And they also repurposed uh, manufacturing institutions at the local level. And I think that the biggest one and, and sort of the key um, ability for them to do that was this um, ability to get uh, lending through one of the development banks for expansion of manufacturing capacity. And one of the things that they were able to do that was sort of uh, giving engineers in these other countries that I traveled to teary eyes was they had enough financing to build designated research plans for for manufacturing R&D. And so in most places, you sort of have to get a slot where they shut down production and then you can do your R&D experiments on the production line. And the Chinese firms in wind and solar had kind of designated research production lines that allowed them to really kind of perfect the skill. And that was in large part because local governments were backing these loans. And so they were also backing these loans sort of in the wake of the financial crisis when companies in many parts of the world had difficulty raising financing and that wasn't a problem in China. Um, it didn't help all of them. Suntec went bust, which is why uh, sort of the data stops there. But there was plenty of capital for, for expanding these, these manufacturing uh, plans. And so 
what you get essentially is these sort of very drastic cost reductions in both of these industries as a result of this division of labor in which China was kind of a very key um, element and also the location where all of this stuff came together. And so um, I promised to talk about decoupling. So far, I haven't talked about decoupling at all. I've mostly talked about coupling, which is sort of, uh, you know, maybe kind of a little nostalgic at this point. But where does this, where does this leave us, right, at this point? And what does this sort of tell us about the current moment? I basically argued that um, this sort of era of globalization enabled countries to maintain these very distinct national identities and these economies, national institutions, and sort of distinct industrial practices um, in ways that I think is a little surprising given sort of our conventional wisdom about, about globalization. And we are now in this moment where we for the longest time thought that kind of you know, France needed rescuing and globalization, but it now seems like globalization itself might be the one in need of rescuing as um, we sort of pushed uh, away from it. I think the pandemic just exaggerated or accelerated a process that, that was already underway. Um, and now all of a sudden we're in this moment where economies around the world are sort of, you know, putting in local content requirements or trying to move away from these global supply chains and are really trying to nationalize um, production, particularly in these industries. As I said at the beginning, because there's so much public money involved, um, they want these local economic outcomes. And so the latest uh, development last week was that in response to the US Inflation Reduction Act, I mean, not explicitly, but probably, China is now considering, which has local content requirements for wind and solar and batteries um, for the US uh, in various ways. China now has announced that it's considering export controls for a set of solar PV technologies. China currently makes 97% of the solar wafers. So basically like the, the silicon gets sort of squeezed into a block and then it's cut very thinly and that these sort of disks are what the, what the cells are being kind of made on essentially. Um, and China is the world market leader in making these very thin disks of, of, of silicon. Um, and is now trying to prevent its companies from taking those production technologies abroad, um, maybe to respond to these incentives and bring them to the US to open a factory here. Um, so we'll see, see what happens with that, but it's not just on the US side. I think China is responding, the Europeans have their own package of industrial policies that are becoming increasingly sort of push uh, a response to this, this localization requirement in the US. Um, and I think that's highly problematic um, in these industries in particular. I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting to have local production, some local production, but these rules are now becoming very restrictive in industries that we need very desperately to meet global decarbonization targets. And we don't have much time left. Um, so to meet 2030 targets, it's now only seven years away. We really need to get the stuff into the ground. And currently, it seems very unlikely that we can do that without working with China, right? So the current system is able to produce these things at scale at relatively low cost. Um, China makes, you know, at least 66% of the world's solar panels. And as I said, 97% of the solar wafers. So like a key kind of ingredient there. Um, it's a big supplier of wind turbines, but also wind turbine components for manufacturers all over the world. So companies like GE in the US source a lot of their equipment from there. Um, it's one of the largest markets and suppliers of EVs and now makes um, a, you know, the vast majority of electric uh, vehicle batteries in the world as well, and has some um, really good IP around some of the production processes for the materials that go into these batteries, right? And so cutting that out of the system will make it really difficult to achieve what already was a difficult task um, to meet 2030 climate goals. And we're seeing this, as I mentioned, not just in wind and solar, which the book is about, but we have a very similar process now where um, in batteries, China is sort of ramping up like crazy. And so this looks like the solar industry in the kind of early 2000s where the US and the Europeans were doing something and China was doing something and then China just expanded. It's not that the others were losing market share, it's just China expanded more quickly. And in batteries, we now have a very, very similar um, sort of system. And so I think I don't have a good solution to this. I think my sort of best attempt to, to make a suggestion here is to think about this more as conscious collaboration and think about, okay, so some things need to come home because voters want to see some factories and get jobs and 
have local economic development as a result of supporting these industries. But if we do this in the wrong way, then we're also jeopardizing um, a lot of the goals that we collectively have sort of agreed on in very difficult negotiations and that are critical for, for sort of safeguarding the future of this planet. And so I think there are um, opportunities to increase benefits for US firms and make firms in this country more competitive in this space without necessarily pushing out Chinese firms. I think the pie is also growing so quickly that there'll be enough for everyone. Um, I think that there are a lot of opportunities in other parts of the world to actually learn from China. So if we want to get good at this, we don't really know how to manufacture. So what were the institutions that Chinese firms relied on, like the kinds of financial institutions? We don't really have a good financial sector in this country for manufacturing, for instance. Um, and so I think we need to sort of reframe this conversation and make it less about kind of pushing China out of these industries, but more about what can we learn from Chinese industries if we want to improve our kind of uh, the share that we have at home. And I think with that, I'm out of time and look forward to kind of continuing this conversation about decoupling. All right. So we can move the chairs and just sort of sit down here and have a conversation. Dr. Ob, I swear I won't go in the chair. Water. Right. Uh, so thanks, Jonas. Even though the book came out over a year ago, it's still relevant. So that's always nice to, to have your, your academic projects kind of become more relevant in time. Yeah, I was worried about that. A long time to write. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine a lot of case, case work in there. Um, so I, I guess I wanted to pull on a couple of things. Um, okay. Maybe starting with Chinese proposed export control, because this to me is a very fascinating um, development, because as far as I'm aware, it's the first time the Chinese have ever attempted to put an export control on a clean tech component. And it's arguably in response to all of the decoupling initiatives by the US, but also increasingly in Europe. I'm, I'm just curious, um, is that gonna be successful? All right. Is that is there something strategic about that choice that makes uh, the choice to to restrict that protect that um, mm -hmm. those particular sets of equipment? And what political benefit does that serve? Can you understand what what was what was sort of the set of decision making that went into that in Beijing? I think that these particular technologies in the solar production space that are now targeted with these export controls were not picked. Randomly, I think there are all um, parts of the supply chain where China makes 95% of the world's production equipment for those particular steps. And so it has a sort of stronghold, like it's a choke point, right? Like they have a lot of leverage in that particular space, maybe more so than in most other segments of these supply chains. Um, and so there's really no competition. I think it's too early to tell. I was, um, on a call this morning really early with a bunch of Chinese manufacturers uh, who were asked this question, sort of who else could do this if you guys can't export the stuff anymore? Um, Japan and Germany used to provide that kind of equipment and sort of fell behind China technologically because it wasn't interesting to them economically anymore. A couple of years ago, they could catch up and probably get back into this space, but it would take a couple of years. And if, and so then we're back in this 2030 game where we're like, you know, this could just delay us. And I think politically, the reason this is happening is because I think there are concerns that now with these local content requirements in other parts of the world, these industries are just going to, you know, firms, Chinese firms are going to take this equipment and this established plants in other parts of the world. And I think the government wants to send a signal that that's not how they have it. It's, and I think it cuts to this much deeper problem that we have in this climate related industries where governments around the world have essentially said, we will invest public money into the transition to clean sources of energy, but we'll promise you local economic results as a you know, sort of growth and employment. Um, and so if we in the US now say, okay, we're taking this very seriously, we're forcing companies to make stuff here, 
it's at the same time undermining that same argument that governments in China and Europe have made to their people, right? And so it becomes this very complicated dance of how much do you need politically for the kind of climate transition to be sustainable and how much do you overshoot the goal? And then we essentially sort of slow down the whole process when nothing will work. So I think that's kind of this hit for tap moment we're in right now with, with the export controls. It's very early. They haven't actually like released any detail on what this would uh, entail. But already, I think everyone's thinking if they're doing this in solar, what's next? What are the parts of the battery supply chain where they could do similar things? Yeah. yeah. And so you know, it turns out we need them. Yeah. And it, and it comes on the heels of the US government sort of floating in informal ways that they may be considering controls on clean tech equipment like they were doing, like they did for semiconductors. Right. And, you know, and this was sort of in advance of Blinken's canceled trip to China. So there's, there's this kind of potential political, maybe a messaging, but um, I guess I was curious because you mentioned the German manufacturers are so good at reinventing themselves. Maybe there's a new NAM group in Germany that could take over in a couple of years that was, you know, once making- I wish all my cousins had, <laughs> had this kind of skills that probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> okay, you uh, engineer at heart, okay. No, but I mean, I think, yeah. I think it also speaks to this broader tension we have in these industries where, Climate is a global problem. We all need to sort of agree on goals. There's some degree of global collaboration that needs to happen, but it's also now becoming an economic policy domestically that pushes against this sort of idea of collaboration. I mean, the Europeans are in Washington right now trying to hammer this out with the Biden administration because they're also annoyed about US policy in this space. Yeah. Um, and I think they probably have different channels of communication than China, but it's and it's a problem that sort of is, is now everywhere. How yeah. do you reconcile a local economic nationalism that's necessary politically with a problem that requires everyone to work together? Mm -hmm. And so climate change came very late in your talk, almost like a postscript. Um, so there were lots of other reasons, obviously, besides climate change or environmental benefits that were <clears throat> prompting these industrial policies in certain contexts. What I guess, how does that intersect with these particular sectors? Is there some way in which climate change or the urgency of climate change has uh, makes these sectors look different when you think about industrial policies affecting, say, specialization or innovation invention? Um, I think there's a couple of questions in there. I think one, Just one way to think about it is I mean, I think the U.S. is sort of a little unusual because there's no consensus here on the fact that this is a problem across political parties. I think other governments were in that space 30 years ago and there was less debate. But there was sort of an investment in these new sources of energy for climate reasons and energy security reasons early on, but they were kind of scientific endeavors. They had, it had never worked. And then in the 90s and early 2000s, when you got um, kind of prototypes that became cheaper and and you had some installations of these things, I think governments sort of realized, oh, this could really be an important industrial area in the future. And so I think then support for these industries sort of shifted from like purely, you know, kind of environmental research and development projects into sort of industrial policy projects in most places. Mm -hmm. um, and does that explain this graduation as well? Like US invention, Germany's you know, specialization in China at the tail end of mass manufacturing because the political motivation for acting on climate in China came later? Or do you feel- like I mean, that's, I don't that's know. Kind of I, you know, I think in China, these industry. industries were always seen as potential export industries. Yes. And then, so I think yeah. now all governments have arrived at this idea that you need to combine environmental and economic objectives for this to be successful. I think the Chinese government started with economic objectives and then added the environment. I think everyone arrived at that position maybe at different times and on slightly different paths, but I think we're all you know, like there now. Okay. And so I think for me, you can't really think about climate um, or, or rather climate as a political problem is inherently now tied to economic policy making, um, which is why I started with the economic policy making and, and Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, uh, one last question, then I'll open it up to, to folks here. Uh, so you mentioned early on China's had sort of several decades of indigenization uh, policies, you know, and 
think of sort of the classic import substitution narrative where they start with importing then maybe licensing and then maybe want to develop their own technology so they're not as dependent on foreign suppliers. Now in the US, now we have this onshoring, right? We want to bring back manufacturing. Those are two related but somewhat distinct sort of policies. Can you walk through what, what might you think are the different political motivations for those two? Sort of indigenization in China and then onshoring in the US. Yeah. I think every government I've studied for this book was unhappy with where they ended up, right? They all thought that they were going to get these completely domestic industries that could do all of those things at home. And so a lot of their spending for these sectors was sort of premised on that outcome. And then nobody got what they want, right? Like they all got something, but it wasn't what they dreamed of. And so the US and China are sort of dissatisfied with their position for kind of opposite reasons. The US is the world's largest investor in clean energy R&D historically, and basically got a very small economic footprint. Startups don't employ a lot of people. A lot of these technologies were commercialized abroad. And so it seemed like a lot of money went into this and we didn't really get that much as a result. Of course, we did get a lot of as a, as a result, right? Because we also benefited from cheap Chinese solar panels that were maybe based on US technologies. I mean, the thing came full circle, but it wasn't the kind of benefits that we thought. And so the US, I think, has been really worried about for political reasons, what to do about the manufacturing problem, how to create middle-class jobs, how that ties to these industries and was trying to kind of move from just invention into the production of these things. Mm -hmm. And I think China felt like they had nailed manufacturing, but also to be kind of a successful economy in the long run, wanted to be owners of that intellectual property in these sectors. And I think, so the dissatisfaction was sort of from a different direction. Mm -hmm. The idea was how do you encourage firms um, and local governments actually to move into more kind of experimental R&D so that you might own the next generation of these technologies um, without having to rely on mm -hmm. foreign partners. And to some degrees, there is more manufacturing now in the US than there used to be. Um, there's a lot of announcements on new plants going up in response to the IRA. There's also a lot more innovation of the sort of US kind now in China than there used to be. So people are moving into these different directions, but I don't think anyone has completely been able to withdraw from the international system. And I think that's where it gets dangerous for meeting climate targets. Great. All right. So questions in the room, I guess we'll start with there. So I really love the term collaborative advantage. I think that's a term that's probably China, the Chinese leaders would like too, because they hate the term competitive, right? And collaborative is always good. But I wonder whether what you're describing as sort of collaborative advantage is inherently unstable. That is, what is driving that? Is competition still what is underlying that whole effort mm -hmm. that Germany, German firms, you know, because they wanted to stay, you know, competitive, they said, okay, we need to, you know, partner with China and use their industrial manufacturing capacities and then we specialize here. And so in the same cases for China. In other words, collaborative advantage, collaborative effort is not really just for collaboration, mm -hmm. but really they want this is a one way of competition. Right. And in that sense, you know, there have been many different forms that kind of collaboration has has taken place. Like joint venture I thought about and that's a form of collaborative Advantage. Yeah. And, or, you know, during globalization, this effort to recombine resources, you know, you get German engineers, American maybe uh, uh, designers, and Chinese laborers to all in one place. That's, that's according to your description, it's also a form of collaboration. But, but are these things, I mean, these things are inherently unstable because underlying all that is still competition. I think there's lots of competition in that system. I think the reason why it's unstable is for political reasons, not so much for business reasons. I think the firms prefer collaboration while they also compete with others, right? So I think a good example is Ford announced recently that they wanted to build a battery plant in the US. Um, in Virginia, which would be operated and run by a Chinese cattle, cattle like a Chinese battery manufacturer. And um, 
Ford is competing with all of these other electric vehicle manufacturers right. now, right? So there's lots of competition. They're really concerned about their models and all of this stuff. Ford also knows nothing about making a battery. And so they can collaborate with this Chinese partner on the stuff that they don't know how to do in order to be better at competing with the other car manufacturers. And so I feel like the two are very compatible in a way. The problem is that the the politics sort of gets involved and and you know the government Virginia governor said we don't want this Trojan horse, this Chinese battery factory under a Ford name. And so they declined to give local incentives. And so now it's probably going somewhere else. But I think we have a much harder time accepting this combination of collaboration and competition politically. Firms are are very reluctant to compete head to head in a space that they're not very good at. They'd rather work with someone that is good at for that stuff and then compete on the things where they have core strength, right? And so Ford is good at building entire cars and marketing them and customer data and all of that stuff. But the battery part itself, like that's not their strength. And so that's where they'd rather not spend their time trying to reinvent them and compete with someone that has spent 20 years just developing battery technology. So I think they actually kind of go together in that. There's also a shand on that. Yeah, so we, we have a question, which was Chinese dominance in the battery market compared to the US. And I think you were already starting to answer that. But, um, any additional thoughts on, is the, the, on the dominance of Chinese battery market? Um, I think there was a lot of smart policy involved. I don't think this was necessarily something that had to happen. I think Chinese firms were a little behind in the battery space. And there were great policies to sort of nudge them to the technological frontier first by making batteries for electric buses, which are, can be quite big and don't have to have such much capacity. And then you went to kind of taxis and government cars and sort of like it became ever more um, sophisticated. And, and, but you also had these institutions that allowed these battery firms to raise a lot of money to build battery plants, for instance, in a way that would be very difficult to do in the US as a startup. Um, and so there is this kind of strength, but I don't think it's necessarily coming out of some sort of unfair advantage. I think it's earned and developed over time. And we, you know, we didn't really think about it. I mean, we also didn't really care about electric vehicles until very recently. So this wasn't sort of a priority for us. And now we're trying to kind of get it all very quickly. Um, so, you know, if we want to electrify by 2030, maybe we'll just have Chinese car batteries. It won't be the end of the world. I have to revise <laughs> the NDA way to do that. Yep. Would it be fair to say the reason that we're not able to cooperate with China and Russia is a moral security issue? In particular, China's claim to the South China Sea, which is contrary to international maritime law. And that to me is the reason that the cooperation between the United States and China stopped. With regards to Germany's interaction with the rest of the world, Germany depends on America's security umbrella. It's not just Germany, it's all of Europe and our allies in Asia. So, yeah, no, I think, I mean, I think there is a security that is this, that that's the reason why the collaboration stopped. Well, I think that's the reason why the, or maybe one of the reasons why it's politically difficult to it's work together, politics, but I think at the business to business level, but, the, but like, could you, could you let him answer the question? Sorry. But, but, you know, like, I mean, Ford doesn't care about the South China Sea. They're like looking for someone who can help them build a battery plant. So I think on that level, there's no obstacles. I think the obstacles are sort of, I agree with you, are these geopolitics, but also as we described in a paper that we worked on together that you shepherded through the process, there's sort of very different security dimensions. And I think reliance on Chinese parts is mostly a supply chain risk. It's not necessarily a national security risk. It's not an energy security risk in that traditional sense. Um, and so I think it's also important to sort of think about what are the, what do we mean by security? You know, what kind of security are we talking about exactly? So, um, yeah. yeah.
I think the U.S. and China have had very persistent security problems that are going to be around for quite a long time. They've also yeah. had, particularly in the climate space, a lot of collaboration historically, even when the relationship got sort of difficult around other stuff. Yeah. Like I think climate was always because it's sort of a global public good, a way to um, keep the conversation going, even when there were very few areas of common interest in other parts. Yeah. So I think doesn't look like there's a ton happening at the moment, but maybe this would be the way to start, is to sort of pick something where we can all win. And then... uh, yeah, just don't drop it in a balloon, evidently. Yeah, yeah. I was worried that that would I'm curious about the, uh, the, the topic that is very popular these days. They all uh, start trying to say that we're trying to French shoring instead of just outsourcing all our industries mm -hmm. abroad. So I was thinking, um, a lot of the economists have been discussing the possibility of um, like a, a industrial supply chain based around the U.S. and the other one based on China. So thinking about like, what do you think about, especially in terms of batteries, a lot of the Korean and Japanese firms were allowed to set up factories here and, or maybe not, the, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act is not giving them a lot of subsidies or whatever. So my question is, what do you think of the ramifications of these kind of French flooring and a different separations of industry and supply chains. Yeah. And the other question is, um, is they talk about like uh, China and Germany, they have different uh, distribution of uh, the work that they're doing and different levels of their, in, their, in terms of value chain and everything. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking about, uh, do you think that's possible that many of the Chinese firms, they might want to move to the area, like if they continue to upgrade their economy, well, well possibly like one day, yeah. they have to directly compete with the German firms like they have like doing have like they have been doing with many of the Korean suppliers and battery manufacturers. Yeah. On the French shoring, I think actually we have there's this huge debate about reshoring always. I think we use the term very loosely, but actually if we sort of define it very precisely as like bringing back productive activity from like another country back home. I mean, it's reshoring, right? Like, so the idea was that it was offshored initially, and now we're forcing it back. It happens very rarely. And the reason it happens very rarely is that neither politicians nor businesses really want it. You get a lot of political points talking about it, but telling companies how to structure their supply chains, like the government is you know, usually running against a lot of opposition. And so, so there's not a lot of cases where that happens. I think what happens more often is that there are incentives for diversification. And I think that maybe is also a more reasonable thing. I don't think it makes a lot of sense to rely on one country to do all the solar wafers in the world. Um, we've seen this when the Fukushima incident happened and the global auto suppliers all, like, I mean, the auto industry shut down because there was a bunch of suppliers in that area that were doing all of the parts for a particular thing and then no one would produce it in cars, right? So there's good reasons to diversify. I think there's fewer um, incentives to bring things back. Uh, on the German question, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, I think that China is going after these sort of high value parts of the supply chain. And part of this export control now is about production equipment that's developed in China for the wafer industry, right? Um, and I think the German firms have moved on to other things because they also are small and they're not able to even produce production equipment at that scale for, for sort of an industry that's growing that quickly. Um, but it does mean that they have to kind of find the next thing over and over again, which might be risky in the long run. I do think that there is a political importance to manufacturing jobs. And the reason that Germany was able to retain manufacturing in that relationship made it politically easier to work with China on other stuff. And the US didn't have any manufacturing in this in these sectors. And so I think we focused a lot on that, but made it harder politically. And one of the hopes that I have is that even if the IRA is unsuccessful in bringing all of the stuff back, once we have some stuff in manufacturing, maybe we can be more generous about other parts of these supply chains politically. Like maybe if we know how to do, you know, 30% of our own demand in some of these sectors, we won't be so upset that China is providing, you know, also 40% and we import that, that percentage. So we're, you know, the relationship is so unbalanced right now that it's hard to be generous. And I think maybe if we move a little bit in that direction, then we'll be a little less stubborn about the other bits. Sure. Thank you. I think we might have time for just one last question. Uh, and yeah, in the back. Yes. 
Can you talk a little bit about so with the concept of collaborative advantage of how IP sharing works? I know you brought up one of your slides um, about licensing agreements. Is that generally how this works in order to make sure that the innovation is moving towards the advanced manufacturing and advanced manufacturing mm -hmm. can be done on big scale? Or can you talk about some of the nuances with IP? Yeah, there were different, very different arrangements. Um, so licensing was one way of doing it and that's often sort of seen as this very clean handoff but actually there was also reverse licensing where like a german firm would license the technology to technology to a chinese firm the chinese firm would then scale it up and change it and the german firm would buy a license back for like the improved version so there was sort of you know two-way travel in that way there were a lot of joint development agreements where you basically say we will now collaborate for a year and share r d expenses and then there's some sort of sharing arrangement afterwards um sometimes this is just a customer supplier kind of relationship right so if you are a car manufacturer you work very closely with your battery supplier because all of these um performance metrics are sort of baked into the design and so in the design process you need to collaborate right so that's part of a kind of contract between the supplier and the manufacturer um i think there is a sort of assumption that there's a lot of ip theft but actually in clean tech sectors that didn't really happen very much at all um and i think that's because there were lots of options sort of legal options to work together there are also design houses so for instance there's engineering firms that will design you a wind turbine if you pay them a bunch of money and so if you don't know how to make a wind turbine, you can buy a design from a design house, right? So there were options available to get uh, the IP. Um, and so I think most firms found legal ways to do this together. Um, yeah, and, and so there was a lot, there were a few kind of high profile cases of theft, like maybe one or two, um, but given sort of how vast these industries are and how many different kinds of linkages there were between these firms, there really wasn't very much. Great. Maybe we should go and hire this firm to design us a wind turbine. That sounds fun. Yeah. yeah. I, I can put you in touch. Right? <laughs> I, have all, I have all the cute. All right. I didn't need a capital. Um, great. Well, uh, just, I wanted to um, just thank uh, Jonas for being with us today and giving us such a stimulating talk and a great book um, that hopefully everyone will go out and, and study. Uh, yeah. Can I say one thing about that? Sure. Yes. So I have I got this very generous offer from Johns Hopkins to buy the open access rights to the book. And so if you go to the Oxford University Press site for the book, there's a little button that says open access and you can click it and it gives you the whole PDF. Of the book right there. Wow. Also legal. I'm really sharing that <laughs> so we can collaborate. With so we can other. collaborate. Oh, that's great. Yes, we love open access books. Yes. So, All right. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for helping. Um, and before we close tonight, just wanted to announce that we're going to have uh, Professor Bobby Yang uh, give us a lecture on the Wuhan lockdown from the voices of the city's own people um, from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so thanks all for joining and see you next time. On the anniversary, the third, on oh, the third anniversary. It's on the third anniversary of the Wuhan lockdown. I don't know if that's <laughs> something to celebrate, but hopefully <laughs> we will learn a lot from the Wuhan, the Wuhan clone people in that. So see you all next time. Thank you.